Hi friends, welcome. Today I want to talk about the work of travel filmmaker Tim Kellner. He has something in his films, uh, it's a plethora of some things really, that set him apart from other filmmakers for me. I will link below to his things, he has wonderful work. Let's talk about his films. The first film of his that I want to talk about today is called Alaska. This is a three minute and eight second long film. His films tend to be quite short. This is a unique quality of his work. Even though his short films are rather short indeed, he still manages to tell a complete feeling story. As the film starts, we hear a man speaking in a language. I'm not sure what language this is, what you would call it, even though I assume it is native to Alaska. We see English subtitles that indicate that he is saying, I could see everything. I could pass through the earth. I could pass through the sky. That gave me this light. In terms of music, we hear a thumping beat that is quickly cut off by what sounds like a melodic harp. This thumping beat is foreshadowing of another beat that will come in later on in the film. This is a beat that will thump sporadically over and over throughout the first three-fourths of the film until a point at the end where the film picks up and the beat has a more constant presence. The colors have a faded, balanced, and rich quality to them. Throughout the film, we see a mixture of lockdown and flowing handheld shots, with the controlled shaky nature giving the film drama and character. Throughout, the music has a swelling and dissipating quality to it, along with the sounds of the environments that you are in in the different shots. Starting from the beginning, we see aerial shots flying over what looks like a very wet, green landscape. Lots of grass. This is followed by jarring transitionary shots of what looks like a raging river and perhaps a forest, followed by a man walking towards a helicopter. We then see a shot of two bears running. One has a fish in his mouth. I hear there are a lot of bears in Alaska. This makes a lot of sense to me. We see a shot of the ocean late in the evening, pink clouds surrounded by much more blue clouds. We see a yellow sky that fades into a, a bluer sky as we move from the right to the left side of the frame. This is followed by a close-up shot of a bear that if you found yourself in that situation in real life, you would probably die. Unless you were in Alaska, because the bears are fed well in Alaska. Lots of fish to go around. You can make friends with the bears in Alaska. They will invite you over for tea and salmon. You guys can share war stories and where you go to get groceries. Until it gets awkward when they mention eating a person a while back and how good that person was. And then you find a moral conflict arise within you. But life is that way, isn't it? We quickly see another transitionary shot whipping across what looks like green bushes, trees, grass. The music is cut off and we see a man, I assume it could be Tim, walking towards the water. Here we have a beautiful lockdown shot on a beach. We see the bay in the background, beautiful cloud cloaked mountains, dark in appearance, very shadowy against a bright gloomy sky. He makes his way towards the water. For a moment, we hear nothing but the wind, followed by an ethereal, melodic harp. We see more shots of the bay, a bird standing on a tree, followed by shots of beautiful flowers in a field. A dramatic shot as if we're flying through a forest, followed by a beautiful shot of us riding a train through the mountains. The train is blue with yellow stripes going all the way down the side. To me, this shot is photographically brilliant and could stand on its own as a photograph. The shadows are very dark on the bottom half of the frame, below the bridge, around the train. There's no detail in the shadows. On the top half of the frame, on the right side, we see a glacier moving through some mountains. We see a gloomy sky covering the top of those mountains. There's a beautiful contrast here. The train itself is a bit of a leading line where the closest part of the train is with us. We are riding it. And as it moves into the distance, you see the train go all the way back until it ends. One of the things he does beautifully in his films is adds ambient sounds. Plenty of filmmakers do this. It's a great way to immerse 
the people who are watching your film into the environment through the ambience. Makes them feel like they're there, along with the music that provides an emotional quality that accentuates the emotional quality that you would feel if you were there. He mixes these ambient sounds and the ambient music that he tends to use so beautifully in a way that is quite mesmerizing and enthralling. In the next shot, we see a silhouetted girl taking a photo out the window of the train as it moves. In the background, the part that is in focus, we see more mountains, a different part of the landscape. We see dark forests and grass covering the mountains in a patchy way until you get to the top of the mountains where there's not so much vegetation. These different shots give us a different angle of the environment that we're in. It helps us connect dots together and create context. While the girl in the frame, a sort of subframing element in this situation, provides more context. We move into a shaky aerial shot going over a, a raging river that sits in the middle of a forest. We then move into a close-up shot of some fish swimming in what I assume would be that river. He edits in a way that creates connections in the mind. Even though he may have taken this shot of the fish swimming in a completely different river, thousands of miles away from the other river, could have been a, a pond in his backyard, we're able to make a connection between the two in this case. Builds more context, puts us in the environment in a more immersive way. We then move into some of the most epic shots in the film, and these are shots of an enormous glacier. We feel like we're on a moving boat. We have the parallax of a hill in the foreground as the glacier comes out from behind it, almost like it's introducing it to us. The glacier is huge. We see another shot focusing on that hill for a moment and then move into another shot close up, looking up at the glacier. We see the details, the jaggedness. It's very blue and daunting. We move into another shot of a bit of the glacier falling off into the water. This is just a small break off. It's not an epic shot of an enormous section breaking off and creating a 20,000 million foot wave, but we're reminded of the power that is within the glacier. What could happen if you were there at just the right time? By the way, don't forget to create your emergency kit for when a 20,000 million foot wave hits your town. It's important to have a toaster, an umbrella, a rifle, a baby bonnet, only if you have a baby. And milk and bread, for some reason. People tend to get that. Even though it's they're both perishable, it doesn't make any sense. We move into a plethora of shots of a diversity of scenes within the Alaskan landscape. A shot driving down the road. A shot of a house. A shot from within a house. Hopefully it wasn't breaking and entering. A shot gliding through the forest with mountains in the background. A shot of water. A wave crashing. Another shot at what looks like dusk, looking out into the ocean, we see a dark sky, dark ocean, we see a stripe of the sky, brighter, where the clouds aren't, we see the moon. This shot cuts off the music, and we hear that same man again, I believe at least. I have not compared voices though. He says, across the ocean is the island of bears, the keeper of dreams. I wonder... Has he actually crossed the ocean to the island of bears, to the place where dreams are kept? Or did he, from the safety of his home, ingest ayahuasca and venture there in his mind? Either way, I'd like to give it a shot. One of the things that he does in his films that I find intriguing is he will often hold the camera and tilt it to where it starts diagonal one way, becomes straight, and then moves diagonal the other way a sort of rolling motion. This adds to the already mesmerizing feel of the film, kind of throws it off the deep end. It's in your face. It's a technique that a lot of filmmakers would potentially avoid. It's kind of rogue, it's kind of crazy, but his creative mind allows it. He's open to it. We have a shot of rainwater rolling across a window, followed by an aerial shot of a mountain. We then see a shot of a helicopter landing in a field with trees scattered about, assuming he's not going to land on the trees. We realize that perhaps the water on the window was the window of the helicopter, that the water was flying across as the helicopter flew, that the aerial shot of the mountain 
was perhaps from the helicopter. We once again see these connected dots that he gives to us. As the shot of the helicopter shadow comes in, so does a beat. We're now dropping into a special part of the film. It feels like something's coming. We then see various shots of bears wandering around a stream catching fish. Along with that beat, we hear a sort of wailing sound. I can't quite put my finger on what exactly is making the sound, but it's very organic, along with the bears. We have a wild feeling. The music pairs with the visuals beautifully. We see shots of bears running with fish in their mouth. We see shots of bears going after fish. There's an uneasy pad that's swelling up in the background. At one point, we see a shot of some bears running very close to the person with the camera, as well as the people around the person with the camera, one carrying a fish in his mouth. It's a bit tense. As we see these shots, we also hear the sound of bears, the kinds of sounds that would remind you that your life is about to end if the bears weren't in Alaska and enjoying a fist feast, fi fish feast. After this collection of bear-y shots, we are back in the helicopter once again, lifting off, leaving the bears behind. It looks like one of the bears actually wanted to get on the helicopter and go to town, but they didn't let him, probably due to weight restrictions. We see a shot from the front left-hand seat. We see the innards of the helicopter, and we see the mountains in the background. This is followed by a sort of selfie angle of Tim. He tends to do these a lot. He likes selfie angles. Sometimes they're quite in intimate, in fact. We then see a beautiful aerial shot of Alaskan mountains, river meandering through the middle, green, thick grass and trees all about. On top of that, we see the text, Tim to the Wild, which is something that he seems to put on the end of all of his films, that, which makes sense. He is Tim to the Wild. I, if it was like, you know, McDonald's, I would be a bit confused. Uh, it would kind of throw off the whole vibe, like what... What was, what was going on here? Was this a sponsor? Are they coming out with Alaskan salmon nuggets? Are they coming out with a bear burger? This would raise all sorts of questions, and I'm kind of glad that it says Tim to the Wild. So with this film, we see a three minute and eight second journey with an engaging and mesmerizing narrative. It's easy just to make a montage. He goes further. He takes the time to figure out what story he's trying to tell. And at the beginning, it may not be apparent to him. Perhaps he has to do a bit of writing to figure out what that story is. But creative open-mindedness and effort will lead us to a place where we have a more compelling story to tell. Another one of his films which I greatly enjoy is called Dreams in Asia. As we begin, with shots of Tim in his insane hotel, we hear a lady with a Chinese-English accent sharing various details. As we move through the film, underneath sounds of urban activities and wind, we hear an ethereal pad that will develop into an ethereal beat and a smooth melody. We visit various rather famous locations in Asia. Near the end, upon reaching Tokyo, we finally drop into a lively, energetic beat for a moment before the film ends. Throughout the video, as we move from location to location, we see various location titles upon arriving to said location. We see the location first listed on top through the symbols of the language of said location, and then on the bottom in English. These titles are quite small in the middle of the frame, and they have a very pleasing font. I enjoy when they pop up, they make me happy inside. As we move through the film, we also hear more voices sporadically. We start to see that this is a pattern in his work. For example, when we arrive to Bali, we hear a voice saying, Closely wedged between other islands of Indonesia lies Bali, a small volcanic island with mountains towering 10,000 feet above the sea. Later on, when we are in Kyoto, we hear a Japanese woman's voice saying, We're still in the city but I feel like we're deep in the mountains, and I feel at one with nature. I can really see Kyoto's expertise. So these voices seem to be a common thread in his work. They're a fantastic, immersive, and sort of mysterious way, given that you don't know exactly where the voices are coming from, who's saying it, what piece of material this came from. You also don't understand quite what they're getting at at the very beginning of hearing them. You have to follow along. 
These mysterious disembodied voices let you know that this is a special place, a place to be paid attention to. A lot of times they're telling you things about the magic of the place that you're in. So, if we move to the beginning of the film, we see the first shot. This is a shot that could be a photo. It is a strong composition. It is a story in a single frame. We see a silhouetted Tim sitting up in his bed in a hotel room that is amazing. The light outside seems like morning light, and this is something that is echoed by the fact that he is laying in bed and waking up. I guess he could have been taking an evening nap. Looks like morning to me. Everything inside the room is incredibly shadowy. You can't make out the detail in his face. He's on the right side. There's a big screen TV on the left side. We see windows, floor to ceiling windows with curtains drawn, semi-translucent. And then in the background, we see the city of Beijing, or at least part of it. We see a pretty crazy looking building up close, shaped kind of like an arch. We see framed within that arch building in the background, another building that looks quite nice. And then we see other various buildings around. The sky is this faded, bluish, pinkish color that as we move towards the bottom, moves into a darker, more rich blue. This shot has such a vibe. This shot makes me want to get up for sunrise every single day. <laughs> it reminds me of the simple joy to be found in waking up in the morning. All of the times I've had to wake up very early for something and the nostalgia that comes with that. And of course, compositionally, this frame is wonderful. He sets himself apart just by his ability to set up a camera on a tripod. We move from that first shot to another uniquely composed shot of him on the right in the shower and a cityscape on the left outside of a window. We then see a couple of handheld shots where the steam has collected on the glass surfaces in the bathroom, one being the glass surface that separates the shower from the not shower, one being the window to the outside world, and we see that he has written the word Beijing onto that window. From there, we see a set of shots from the perspective of his hotel room window, looking at the same buildings we saw at the beginning. We see that arch building with a pretty building framed within the arch from a wider shot and then from a tighter shot. Then we cut to a shot of traffic pointing down. As I'm studying these films, like right now, I'm starting to see how pervasively he connects shots together in patterns. We will see a collection of shots from the same location or with the same theme tying things together. And then from there, we're abruptly in another location with another collection of shots, tying things together. When you first watch his films, everything feels semi-random, kind of all over the place. Still cohesive, but all over the place in terms of where the shots are coming from. But as you dig into them more, you start to see more of his patterns, and I think that's incredibly interesting. Out of these hotel room shots, we move to shots involving people. People moving through various areas. People, I assume friends in this case, getting out of cars, looking up at buildings. Just like that, we've been transported to Hong Kong. We see a man walking around Hong Kong with tall buildings on either side of him. It looks like perhaps he's in a bit of a marketplace, with the bottom floor of these tall buildings being the marketplace, and the upper floors being apartment units, maybe. We see a shot where he's at the very bottom center of the frame, looking up. We see buildings towering. We don't see the top of these buildings, which creates more of a feeling of hugeness. By the way, at this point in the film, a beat has dropped in and we have a lovely smooth groove to enjoy. We have a wonderfully composed shot of many people crossing a street at a crosswalk, which moves into a shot on a train of a window that's sort of rectangular, but with rounded corners the inside of the train being completely dark, the outside being the city going by. Beautiful blue sky, big cloud, perhaps cumulus? I don't know my clouds. By the way, that train appears to be going incredibly fast, and it reminds me that the train industry in America is lacking. I see so much potential in our train industry. I'm excited for Elon to open up that tube where we can shoot, we could be like at the bank where they shoot the, the thing up the tube and then your money comes back to you with a lollipop. 
from that train shot, we are interestingly transitioned to a shot of a waterfall. The camera follows the waterfall down. Very tight shot. We see green in the background. Something interesting that I realized upon this viewing that I didn't catch on the last one is that I think the train was taking us to the place where the waterfall is. This is another example of what I was mentioning a second ago, where things are tied together and you don't quite catch them at first. From there, we move to a shot of somebody jumping off a building into a pool. We are then transitioned from that pool shot to Singapore in another pool on top of a roof. So we went from one pool to another. Isn't editing fun? We are then treated to a quick montage of urban shots of Singapore, including those crazy tree buildings that you find with the, the lights on them, and it looks like you're at Coachella. And then we move to Bali. We see these beautiful, calm, warm-feeling shots of vegetation, a shot from inside wherever I assume he was staying. He's making coffee and or tea, something involving hot water. This is the point where that voiceover comes in. Closely wedged between other islands of Indonesia lies Bali, a small volcano. This quick collection of shots has such a wonderful vibe to it with the greens and the warm reddish shadows of the wooden building that he's in, along with the music and the voiceover and various elements. They all come together to create a rather nostalgic feel, even though I've never been to this place in particular. I am feeling the environment as much as I'm seeing it. Everything he's doing here is warming my heart and it's inspiring me to travel, to go check out this place and other places. There's such a flood of elements into my mind that trigger things, create feelings, change my state. Much of this happening subconsciously, interesting enough. This is the power of the hands of a talented artist. From there, the beat drops back in and we are transported to a beach with dirt bikes. Handheld shots whipping around as dirt bikes go past. I assume him and his friends had a bit of a adrenaline rush. Well, I say dirt bikes. It's actually sort of a strange mix between a dirt bike and maybe an old Ducati motorcycle, perhaps. I, I don't know. These, these aren't motorcycle studies. We have more wonderful handheld shots of various beach activities. I, I think it's so wonderful how he's able to see these things happening around him and capture them as they go. They don't feel contrived. His post-processing along with the light in this scene is very beautiful, late dusk feeling. From there, we see them loading up one of the dirt bike Ducati motorcycles into a truck, indicating that their motorcycle beach activities have ended. We then see a couple of shots on a train, once again going very fast. We see what looks like a few train shots put together with some crazy transitioning happening. And then the Kyoto title pops up. We realize we're now in Kyoto. From there, the beat drops out and we are transported into a calm forest. But we're not just in a forest, we're within a building. Looks sort of like a traditional tea house, perhaps. The bottom is reflected water, almost like it goes on forever, with somebody walking by in the distance. We have more different shots in this area as a voiceover comes in. I think it's incredibly interesting the way he transitions between one scene and another. It demonstrates his creativity and non-linear thinking, the way to connect a bunch of different ideas together into something cohesive in the end. In this film, he's been able to masterfully and in a flowing manner connect like seven different locations together. We experience so much in this three minute and 12 second long film. It feels so dense with information, so rich with experience. And finally, the beat livens up and we see various nighttime urban shots of Tokyo and just like that, the film has ended. Now I'm curious with this film, was everything captured with a strong intact narrative in mind? Or was everything captured randomly? Maybe he didn't know exactly what all of this was gonna mean in the end. 
Maybe he just filmed. He just had his camera with him. He captured the experiences. He came home, put it in the editor, and got to work. Let his mind play. People have very different ways of going about filmmaking. Some people can shoot sporadically, have almost no plan, come back into the editor in the end, hope for the best, come out with something beautiful. Some people like that thrill. Some people start with a very strong written out guideline for exactly what they're trying to do. And that's how they pull together their film. Neither one is wrong. Neither one is weaker than the other. Although each one may have weaknesses in different areas. It's important not to think of the creative process in terms of wrong and right, but cause and effect. When you add input A, what happens? What output occurs? What are the positive things about that output for your project? What are the negative things about that output for your project? Perhaps something that you think is negative might end up being positive. It's very nuanced. Okay, moving on. The next one I want to take a look at is 2 minutes and 23 seconds long. It is called Arctic, and it is very similar to his film called Alaska that we spoke about earlier. By this point, we really start to see the patterns of his work emerging. We begin with a blue, cloudy, I would guess, dusk aerial shot of a vast bay with snow-capped mountains all around. We see the sun peeking through on the left-hand side. We hear the sound of wind and a faint drone of a pad. Throughout the film, this pad will be violently interrupted by an echoing stringed instrument. And at one point, a drum will join in on the quarter notes. An eerie echoing voice will also join in, giving the film a cold, uneasy, but organic and mesmerizing feeling. The colors are rather dark and quite frigid feeling, with contrasting warm shadows. And we have yet another voice and yet another language that I can't identify, saying, I think over again my small adventures, my fears, those small ones that seem so big, and yet there is only one great thing, the only thing, to live to see the great day that dawns, and the light that fills the world. Now, this man does not speak of bears in this quick poetic collection of words, but there are polar bears in this film. Throughout this film, we see plenty of aerial shots, some feeling like they were captured from a drone or a helicopter, some feeling like they were just captured on the deck of this enormous ship that he was upon while filming this film. The reason I say this is because, one, you can see the ship in the film, and also, I believe this was the same trip he took with Ben Brown a while back, and you can actually find those vlogs. I'll, I'll link to those. Those were fantastic. On Ben's channel, it was uh, like 10-part series of them traveling into the Arctic, going into the ice, seeing polar bears, hanging out with some people in the very small towns that you would find. It's a wonderful evergreen series that you could throw yourself into if you have some extra time that needs to be filled with escapism and inspiration. Anyway, plenty of aerial shots, plenty of shots looking down on things, but also plenty of detail shots of ice and water. This is mixed in with shots of life aboard the ship, a man in a hoodie walking up some stairs with the Arctic landscape in the background, someone pointing a camera out of a window also creating art while the person is creating art of them creating art. I suppose given the pattern, there could have been a third man filming and or taking a photo of the second man who is filming the first man who is filming and or taking a photo outside of the window. Maybe the person was taking a photo of somebody outside of the window who was filming and or taking a photo. Wow. Perhaps there was a line of men and women stretching all the way around the ship with cameras pointed at each other until the line came all the way around to the front of the very first lens of the person who was pointing the camera out the window. Ah! We also have some lovely, very shadowy, moody shots of the bridge of the ship in the late evening, I suppose. We see the instruments of the ship, Detailed shots of the instruments, wide shots of the instruments, with the Arctic landscape in the background once again, beautiful square windows that you would find on the bridge of a ship. 
At one point, we have a detailed shot of a map. We have a shot of what looks like dark water out of focus with snow falling in the foreground. It actually looks a bit like something you would see in the, the intro sequence of like a Metal Gear Solid game or something. I really like it. At one point, we find ourselves on land with water close by, indicating that we have just come ashore. There is a shack. We see a wide shot of the outside of the shack, a shot of what I believe is the inside of the shack, followed by a tighter detail shot of some broken glass and broken other materials inside the shack as well. We have a mini story within the bigger story of this dilapidated shack that perhaps someone hasn't been inside in 20 years. You can't help but think about the memories that these walls hold. Stories that were told, meals that were had, epic games of Rocket League that were won. <laughs> Tim does this type of thing well and with finesse, these mini three-shot stories within the greater stories that are his films. Overall, in a sense, this film is simply a collection of well-composed shots of the Arctic. He ran around with his camera, hit record, brought those clips back to his computer, offloaded them, put them in the editor. He then began to knit together this pile of clips that are organized with file names that are uppercase letters and numbers with dot mp4s at the end into something that has a feeling, an atmosphere. It creates a pleasing and engaging but also profound and meaningful quality. It creates some of the feelings that perhaps you would feel if you were there. It makes you wrestle with some of the ideas and questions that perhaps you would wrestle with if you were there. But also, perhaps, all of the layers of artistic additions maybe make you experience it differently than you would have if you were there. Maybe it has something to add to the experience. Hmm. It reminds me that with filmmaking, you really are bringing together a vast symphony of elements to tell a story in a way that's unique to other art forms. Okay, moving on. The last film of his that I want to take a look at today is called Alone in Dash Hong Kong, which would indicate to me that Hong Kong is a place that he was alone in for some period of time. I like this one a lot. We begin with a shot of Tim in what appears to be a restaurant or a coffee shop, sipping coffee or other things that would be sipped out of a cup, like motor oil. We hear his surroundings, including a bustle of eating establishment sounds and a soft guitar riff that seems to be playing from the speakers around him. It is interrupted by another set of sounds as the shots change from him taking a shower to him working at his desk and so on, along with the voiceover of a man on a radio saying, Hong Kong is a Chinese name. It means island of fragrant water. We hear my absolute favorite music track of his that he has used in a film. And you know what? Just take a listen. Sweet Lord, how majestic. And at the end, we have another short voiceover that says, Typified by these homes and apartments on Victoria Peak, the Chinese refer to living on the peak as touching the sky magnificently. The colors are quite similar to the previous film in the sense that they are quite cold with warm shadows. However, this time, due to the different location and context, instead of providing a frigid feel, they provide a calm morning vibe. Hmm, interesting how that works. This one has a bit more of a personal feel to it. All of his have a touch of personalness because of the shots of himself. He likes to put himself in his films. But with this one, he takes it much further. It feels much more like a very polished, very concise vlog of his experience alone in Hong Kong. There are plenty of shots of him. This connected feeling to him begins with the title. He is alone in Hong Kong and is carried out through the way that he films things, through the way that he constructs this film. We're having an introverted experience of Hong Kong with him as well as through his eyes. This is an example of accentuation. With any film, you're experiencing what you're being told to experience through the eyes of the creators 
the camera man, the director, the editor. But in this case, it becomes a prominent force in the film. It comes to the forefront. Just as it is in music, there are quiet elements and then there are loud elements. Understanding and utilizing this hierarchy is a fantastic way to tell a more engaging story. This isn't a film about Hong Kong. This is a film about how he perceives Hong Kong. The things that jump out to him. The people on the street corner selling flowers. The foggy harbor. All of the boats in said foggy harbor. The buildings around him. Perhaps the architecture, the colors, the tallness, the surroundingness of them. The water that is being ruffled by the ferry that he is riding on. He tends to stare out of windows a lot in this film, which makes me curious. Is he interested in what's on the other side of the window? Or is he just interested in the window itself? Maybe he just likes glass. Come to think of it, you see a lot of glass in his films. He uses windows a lot. He always gets the shower shot with the mist on the window. Maybe all of his films are just about his pure love for glass like a YouTube channel that focuses entirely on a love for trains, miniature and full size. Or perhaps it's deeper than that. Ah, maybe he's telling us that we should all be more transparent. Or maybe he's hinting at the fact that there is an AI that is controlling all of humanity, saving us from our own stupidity, telling us what to think so that we will avoid our own utter destruction. Or perhaps he's reminding us that the lizard people are taking our jobs. Maybe the frogs are all turning gay. <laughs> all right. All of these elements, him, the music, the coffee shop, the shower, the foggy harbor, the buildings, the people selling flowers, the glass, the intelligent AI, the gay lizard frogs are all leading us to have a personal experience with him. His films tug on the fierce desire in us to wonder, to wander, to question, to find meaning. I find that dynamic so interesting in this particular case because these are just travel films. They're not 190 minute long documentaries about the cosmos that question the existential nature of life itself. They are three minute long films about places. They're a beautiful collision, interface point, if you will, between a pleasing and engaging piece of content and something that has rich depth behind it. It has thought. And of course, the hours put in and the level of mastery he has over the craft of filmmaking is what makes it uniquely expressed in this way. And of course, of course, it is his vision. It is his soup of inspiration. It's what's in his head and not in another's head that makes this possible as well. That is it for this one. Like I said, I will link below to his things. If you enjoyed this video, if you hit the like button, it lets me know that you did enjoy the video. And that keeps me in a place of encouragedness. It makes me go, hey, I'm doing something that, you know what, people don't absolutely hate, at least, right? Because that's what the dislike button is for, absolute hatred. Um, if there's anybody else that you would like for me to talk about on this series of artists, please let me know. I will be happy to check them out and potentially make a video out of them. Hope you have a lovely day. Goodbye.